friends and didn't have the opportunity to discuss what council would like for level of service um, and the direction that we wanted to take. Um, I'll start with that. I can carry on, but. Yeah, I, well, I can add, like, I, I get where you're coming from. I had a similar sentiment. Um, I think um, this provides us with a starting framework and doesn't necessarily need to go, go to council right away or get approved right away at the next council. But I think it is a starting point for us to move forward and m start making changes or looking at the, it's a draft document, right? Um, so I, I totally get where you're coming from because we, uh, we had lots that we discussed that day and we, we didn't necessarily finish our conversations either. So, um, I think, uh, I think this is a good time to discuss what, what you like about this and what you'd like to see maybe changed. Um, as far as the policy went, it's, um, it's good policy. Um, it's, um, very, it seems to be the provincial standard. Any others that I looked into were very similar town of Cochrane, uh, Mountain View County, Sundry, Olds, um, all very similar, uh, similar wording. So it, um, I don't have a lot of issues. Um, other than the, the one paragraph that, um, third paragraph, last sentence, council has determined the most cost effective and appropriate manner um, in which to deliver protective services within the MD um, is the composite fire uh, organizational structure, uh, that last part. I still have lots of questions about that that have not been answered. We have not had an opportunity to discuss it. I am not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that being in there and going forward. Um, one of my... The highlighted one. Um, and I... I'll take the time right now as I'm scattered. Um, at the last council meeting, um, uh, in reviewing for today, um, I rewatched January and February council meetings and parts of the December budget discussions and was extremely disappointed with myself um, in confusing the matter that um, uh, from the org chart in the last council meeting um, for policy ES9. Um, I was confused about the safety codes and the discussion we had had in the safety codes officer. Um, and, um, and then I brought it forward with misinformation in that one um, and thought it was going to be part of the deputy chief position, which... Um, which was corrected, but it was the safety codes that we had discussed in the budget and holding all of that. And I had muddled it in my head. So after watching all of those a couple of times now, I think I have it straight. Um, but it was still something that was, um, it was on hold. And so I think that um, while we work towards transparency, it's great to identify that role. Um, but that was um, going to wait until we had done our level of service as well. Um, so th th that's just another point that I had muddled. Um, so for, I thought it was waiting rather than um, being in the org chart already. Um, It's just one more thing on the, the list to be discussed for me. I have I have lots of questions going forward that I need opportunity to ask and have answered before we can move forward with this. Okay. 
Um, how do we... Councilor Chisa, what are your thoughts? I'm just wondering if Councilor Smith would be comfortable providing a list of questions to the CAO so that it can be considered by administration and then a fuller discussion can take place at a later time. I don't think that, uh, yeah, I think that would probably be the most effective use of uh, everybody's time. I completely agree. And then for this to come back to GPC or? It's one of those things where you're developing a policy and uh, we're getting the bones of it down right now and then we'll flush out some of the details and then uh, the policy is always going to change so we need somewhere to start and uh, I think if we can help you get through your questions um, it'll move forward that much quicker yeah thank you um, I also had a few questions that I can maybe mention now and then uh, they can just be included in this um, under 4.6 rescue calls, uh, 4.6.3 fire services shall provide surface water and water ice rescue at the technician level. I thought that was something we're not doing. Um, so that was one of the questions I had. And I don't know, I don't know if administration wants to answer these questions now or just document them and then come back. Reeve. Yeah. What if I were to circulate my questions to council? People can add to it, and then we can send it to. Okay, because you might have some. The to same CAO questions. Tut, and then we can okay. make sure that all of our questions are captured. Okay. CAO Tut, uh, what are your thoughts on this? My thoughts are that if there was a list of significant questions, it would have proved for a better conversation today had I received those prior to this meeting. Um, so we'll start again, and if I could please have all questions submitted to me by email so I can work with my administrative staff to obtain the necessary answers for the discussion, and we'll bring it back to a future meeting. All right, thank you. And then those questions will become part of the public record uh, in a future meeting. Again, I think you're discussing policy and does the public really need to see all the questions that we're asking? We're trying to develop a policy that will address all the MD's needs, but just because we have questions, I don't know if those need to be public. If we're creating a bylaw or something, I can see the necessity to do that, but just I'm just throwing it out there. Through the chair to Councillor Tuza, Council's responsible for developing policy and bylaws. So I have no issue with making the questions public um, and providing them as a series involved in working through developing the policy. We've taken our interpretation of the reports we've received, the recommendations that have come forward out of those reports and discussions that we've had with respect to how we could implement those reports administratively and those recommendations administratively. And we've put together what we feel is a solid statement and uh, beginning development of this policy. And then what we need though is to understand uh, what amendments are necessary. So if there are amendments that you can see that are necessary to be part of the next draft, we can discuss those today and continue this through the discussion process and moving it forward. Or if there's too many questions to ask with respect to um, specifics, we'll collect an email from um, each of the counselors that have specific questions and we can create the responses in a, a questions attachment that gets a, addressed in the next draft that comes forward, and we can make uh, any amendments that are necessary for the next draft. All right, thank you. Is there any further discussion right now with this? 
All right, seeing none. Madam Reeve, yeah, if I may ahead. just add one point uh, yeah. for your discussion today. There is nothing in this policy in front of you today that is different. Um, the statement in regards to um, Councillor Smith's uh, first question about the uh, last sentence in paragraph three there, that is our current structure as of today. So on February 2nd, we hired the deputy chief, which is a full-time employee. I am part-time employee with fire, and our casual paid on-call firefighters make up the rest of the structure. Safety code officer wing works in a casual position. So there's no changes. Uh, also with the ice and water rescue, we currently provide those services out of the Eggshell Fire Department and have done for years. Yeah, and I, in terms of that question, I don't know how if this is a policy policy statement for our levels of service, how um, if we're doing it at one fire hall, but no, we're not doing it at the other fire halls, uh, does that need to be clarified? Because um, that's that's where I get confused. <laughs> so, the, in all honesty, that would be uh, on a direction, a uh, an operational type of document, which we already have in our fire department SOPs, which is scope of services, which actually breaks it down. Uh, the first page of the policy statement clearly identifies that we have different levels of service throughout the MD. So we are not, uh, there is no blanket level of service based on resources and, and personnel availability. Okay. CAO Tut. Thank you. Through the chair, another thing to remember when we're reviewing policy for protective services is that it's Bighorn Emergency Services, not Exshaw Emergency, not Ghost Emergency, not Jameson. Those are departments within Bighorn Emergency Services. So when we are developing policy, we're developing it for the municipality as a whole and for Bighorn Emergency Services, particularly in this instance. Just to clarify. Yeah, and that, that was my concern with this question because I know we don't provide, uh, when we make a statement that we shall provide surface water and surface ice rescue, uh, to me it sounds like we're saying that we shall provide that from our, our, our fire halls. <laughs> so uh, if there's another document uh, going into more details, I don't know if that's something that we should also be privy to um, so that we can understand the full picture here. We typically do not release uh, operational uh, documentation because it is considered strictly an internal document. Uh, again, though, paragraph five states quite clearly, council also recognizes that when a response is provided, the service level of that response may be different in various areas of the MD. Okay. Uh, well, we will put together a list of questions. Um, I, <laughs> my hope is when we are creating policy that the policy is very clear so that everybody understands uh, if they're not privy to the interworkings of our SOP that they will know what, what is actually happening in this policy. Um, and it wasn't clear to me. So... Uh, we will put together some questions, and I guess uh, uh, bring bring this back to the next GPC. Um, would anybody like to make that motion, or do, does do we need a motion for that? Okay, then I will need a motion, please. Um, I can make a motion that we. Oh, okay. Um, I'll make a motion that uh, council provides questions to administration, and this come forward to the next GPC. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion on this? I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion has passed. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is item F3, new business, page 15. CAO Tut, I'll let you do your introduction. 
Thank you. Through the chair, I'd like to introduce Director of Corporate and Community Services, Brenda Hugo, to do a presentation regarding the ability to pay. Thank you, CAO Tet. Good morning, Reven Council. Um, this topic, the ability to pay, was a topic that was mentioned as part of the budgeting uh, presentations in that this is really just looking at um, as taxes change, how does it impact the residents? And then further, what is their ability to pay? So the information um, has been gathered, and it was also a commitment as part of budget that this would be brought forward. The first part of the agenda, which is the overview, is really just a repeat of those slides that we went through as part of budget. So it's just resetting the tone. Then we'll get into the ability to pay and then the opportunity for any discussion. So this is just as a reminder where to find it within the uh, December 12th presentation. Um, and then looking at um, some of the background and how to read and um, the comparisons that we used when we were looking at the um, Sorry, the comparisons that we used were 26 different municipalities and it had either similar populations, land mass, uh, mountain parks, region. We did not include uh, KID or the MD of ranch lands due to various reasons. So um, I just want to reset the stage that this is a ranking system. So where do you rank between 1 and 26? So 26 would be the upper end, 1 would be the lower end. And then one of the things that we did was also um, keep the town of Canmore in as our nearest municipality that has a lot of similar, not the same, but similar characteristics being in the Bow Valley, being impacted by tourism, being impacted by um, recruiting efforts as well as affordability issues. So with that, we talked about the general municipal rate, so that is what is the rate that residents pay per 100,000 of assessment value. So the MD was ranked lowest of the 26, Canmore was third, and the highest was uh, Birch Hills County. So I'm not going to go through all of these again, I just wanted to kind of reset the stage. Uh, we also have provided the... Um, source documents where all the information came from. So this is all publicly available information. So we then looked at how do our residential assessments uh, look, followed by our price per dwelling of households and where we're ranked. So very close to Canmore at 22, Canmore's at 24, Town of Banff is at the highest. Uh, average. Sorry, uh, Director Hugo, uh, on the previous slide, is it okay if we ask questions Absolutely. during? Um, is this the price per, um, I think it was the previous slide, that was like the sale price? Sorry. Sorry, the residential assessment value. So what is the average <coughs> assessment value of a residence within? So the assessment value is... Um, based off of sales that have occurred over the prior year or years. Okay. Um, and so the MD's average was just under 690,000. Um, no, that's not right. Sorry, let me get it onto my slide here. Oh, so this is the total assessment value. So that would mean that we have in our residences within the MD um, just shy of, what is that, uh, 700 million in overall residential housing, whereas Canmore would have 8.6 billion. That's the residential value. And that number is then used to get us to the... Price per dwelling. Okay. That, the, I was getting those two slides mixed yeah. up because the million part is missing. <laughs> yeah. Because I thought they would be the same. Yeah. Yeah. No. And my apologies. Yeah. The assessment value is millions and billions or per hundred thousand. 
however you want to look at it. I wasn't sure if it was individual, like the average individual assessment per dwelling, but yeah. that is That's this slide. This slide. Okay. Yeah. So uh, again, where are we ranking relative within the various groupings of 26? So we're in number 22 position. And then how I gave the numbers of the high, the low, and then where we were versus Canmore. So from a, uh, an, an individual person or household perspective, that's a lot of value in a residence, a residential house. So on their net worth, it's, it's impactful at 700,000. Um, then the average taxes per dwelling. So this is looking at what would each of the households pay on average against those 26 municipalities. We were ranked 12th, so kind of middle of the pack. Uh, Town of Canmore was 21st. Uh, Foothill County was the highest at the 26th. Uh, so it's just kind of telling us that, okay, we're not the highest, we're not the lowest, we're in the middle, that quite possibly that there is some area for um, increases to property taxes. Then we're looking at the number of dwellings. So here in the MD, we have just shy of 1,000. Town of Canmore, just over 9,000, so it's a 10 to 1 ratio. Uh, Rocky View County, 15,000, so obviously they have a lot more capacity within their MD to manage. This also kind of highlights the importance of growth and why growth matters. And we're fortunate to be within the Bow Valley, which is a, you know, a desirable place to live. And so I did add in, these are just some of the different topics um, that we talked through as part of the budget. So I'm just keeping all the information consistent all the way through. Um, I'm happy to go through any of these again if there's any questions. Um, and then these are some of the um, areas that the MD or the, sorry, the administration would be looking into for new revenue sources. What's the impact of taxes? What's the capacity for the taxpayer, taxpayer to pay? So that's where we're at today. So in here, um, this is information that we took from Stats Canada. So again, publicly available. So now we're going to start blending what we got from the Alberta government with Stats Can. Um, so this is looking at the average taxable income for an economic family. So within Stats Canada, it's a great organization. There is a bucket load of information there. I went with the definition of economic family as opposed to household simply because the economic family adds in that must be related element. So if you were, a, if there was a household that happened to rent out a basement suite and that person's income from that basement suite would not be included in here. And the reason I excluded that type of activity is because I'm thinking through the when someone's looking at their property tax bill, they're not going to go and talk to their renter about how much more can you increase. It's really a family conversation. So the economic family is about the familial connection. So it can be blood, married in, adopted. Um, so in that, the average taxable income, so the taxable income means total income coming into the house. Uh, we looked at the same 26 communities. Um, where we ranked was 20 on the high side at about 145,000 per economic household. Canmore was two positions higher, Rocky View County even higher. So being an accountant, I then thought, well, I would like to take one more element into consideration. I want to look at the after-tax dollars that these economic families have access to. And the reason I want to look at after-tax is tax is your typically biggest expense. I want to get that out of the way because I really want to look at that capacity or the ability to pay. 
So that then lowered, because these are now your free dollars to spend. So where did the MD land? Just shy, or just over 119,000 in a year. Uh, position number 22 out of 26. So on the higher end within this group of 26. So now we're starting to add in some of the other elements. So this is the estimated household property tax per average after tax per economic family. So where is this all ranking and what does it mean? So in the MD of Bighorn, our average tax is 1320 And just for clarity, this includes that um, you know how we made the change to the policing and we brought it into the budget? So that policing expense is in the budget, in, in that amount. That means that that tax represents 1.11% of the after-tax income on an economic family. Our and we would be ranked sixth out of the 26, so definitely at the low end. So again, just kind of giving that indication that there is capacity to move up. Town of Canmore is at 18, their percentage is 1.63, and the MD of Fairview is at the high end at 26. Um, so what I did, and it's not included in the presentation, is I'm a numbers person. I wanted to see what does, if we were to go from 1.11% to 1.2%, 63% of the economic family within the MD, what would that represent as a total increase to the household? So it would go from 1320 to 1938. Now, I want to be super clear, I am not advocating, I am not bringing that forward as an increase, but I'm simply saying that gives me a bit of a bandwidth of where we can go. So I do know we approved, obviously, the 2024 budget with I think it was somewhere around a $50 increase. So, and I know at the time I had said I'm comfortable knowing that there was a lot of bandwidth. There is still that bandwidth. Any questions with what I've, yeah. Sorry, uh, my brain was still on the previous slide when you introduced this one. What does the HH stand for? Household. Household, okay. Yeah. I'm so, I, I didn't know if it was that. Harvey Heights. That's where I'm <laughs> Oh, fair enough. I'll be sensitive to that. I do have the title in two different places. <laughs> they kind of go beside each other. One on the um, okay. table or chart and then the other. But yeah, because it was so long-winded. Thank you. Any discussion on this? I guess this is more for information. Um, it is, yeah, I guess interesting to understand this. Um, and I also understand that uh, what I hear from our residents is that uh, the low taxes is definitely one of the major attractions of living in the MD of Bighorn and uh, trying to keep it that way is also uh, what we hear a lot. So uh, it's interesting to see uh, that there's capacity, but uh, I think I think that's all, all I really want to say about that. There's capacity, but I don't really want to go there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Reeve. Uh, so again, for clarity, not advocating, just saying, just sharing information. And I can appreciate that when taxes go up, more so than when they go down, but people feel it a lot more when they go up relative to even when they go down. So I get it. It's, an, uh, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship on the emotion based on which direction it's going. Absolutely appreciate that. I also appreciate that there is the, um, 
the respect that that's taxpayers dollars and in the direction that um, we're looking to go with you know levels of service and um, becoming the employer of choice and moving the MD into these types of directions that it's about if taxes go up are they being spent efficiently and respectfully and that's that kind of trade-off um, especially when we're looking at new services and improving levels of service and so on um, and then preparing for um, our assets and the usage of our assets on a year-to-year -year basis so I just wanted to tie those pieces together thank you yeah, thank you for the clarification. Councillor James, go ahead. Um, yeah, through the, um, through the Reeve, um, I kind of, like, I really, I really appreciate this. I get a little um, stammered on, on this. Actually, the, um, actually it's the average after-tax income for the economic family portion because I believe that that would be a very low level for the town of Canmore. Um, they just posted that the average income needs to be, what, $39 an hour for average, which would be an income of 225 or greater than $225,000 a year just to make, um, what was that called? That was the livability and so when I look at that I don't think that anybody um, in the town of Canmore it's 165,000 would be making it very well um, and I haven't evaluated that for the MD of Bighorn and we don't I don't know if we know what our livability costs are. Um, I guess you would take that to the average um, the price per dwelling um, and to, to somewhat evaluate it. I, you know, there's also a lot of very, like, I really appreciate that you can, Canmore is great because it's so close that we can use those services like rec, from recreation to groceries, to fueling, to all of those things, but there's a big difference in what services that are provided in the MD of Bighorn than are in the in the town of Canmore. Um, so I just kind of um, see that, and I appreciate that the ranch lands are out of that because that distance becomes even greater. So we could almost say Dead Man's Flats and Harvey Heights has a grocery store because Canmore is so perfectly close. It's almost as close. It's closer than it is for ranch lands people to get to Cochrane. So anyway, it was just a, a, a thought there. So I just kind of wonder actually what uh, it makes me question even more the um, <coughs> The, the room and capacity for um, tax growth is and um, what our rate payers can do. Thank you, Councillor James. If I can just seek a few points of clarification. I believe you're saying $39 an hour? The cost of living wage. Correct. Rate. They just posted that recently. Sure. It's kind of new. Yeah, so thank you for that. I didn't go, I went to StatsCan. This is 2021 information. So it, it's a little delayed. It's not quite as current. Um, so $39 an hour is roughly 78,000 a year, simple math. Um, so that would tell me at 78, roughly there's two and a bit people living together at the town of Canmore. If that that comparator to what does 165 represent? 165,000 per household is that number. And the household, the members of the household have to be related. Okay, so then the after tax, or it's this one. The after tax is just taking the taxes out so that I can look at the pure expense. Um, and that, again, is an accountant view. Um, if you're 
interested. Um, sorry, where did it go? Yeah, it's just numbers, please. I don't think it needs to be brought up now. But anyway, it's more just saying there may be capacity. So when we are potentially looking at income, our increases to taxes, that we know that there is some play. And again, not advocating that we go 615 per household. That's not it. It's just appreciating the range. The range, by the way, that 615 is roughly 50% of what they're paying right now. So for me, in the accountant's world, that's a lot of rate of increase. Not advocating for that, just sharing context. And I think just to summarize, if, to make sure I understand what Councillor James is saying, uh, even though the town of Canmore uh, might have that 131 after-tax income per economic family, uh, it doesn't mean <laughs> that when you compare it to the amount of taxes they're paying that they're, that they're necessarily being left in a good position. Uh, when you consider the cost of living uh, in the Bow Valley now, um, it's, it's not like there's um, a big buffer <laughs> to just increase taxes. Uh, like that, that uh, after-tax income is already playing it very tight. When you look at the $39 an hour as the, the cost of living, uh, that is just the bare bones cost. That is not uh, not allowing for um, I don't know extras that you might want in your life. So um, yeah, it's it's not suggesting that there's room, <laughs> in my opinion. But um, yeah, is that similar? Is that what you're yeah. okay? Is there any other discussion around this? All right, thank you. Um, can I get a motion to accept as information? Oh, I think that's the last slide, yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I moved ahead. <laughs> um, can I get a motion? Go ahead, Councillor Fitzpatrick. I'll make the motion that Council accepts the ability to pay presentation as information. Thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? I'll call the question all in favor. Motion has passed. All right, it is uh, 10, or sorry, 9.54. We've got a delegation starting at 10, so I'll just call a bio break until 10 o'clock. Thank you.
Okay, sorry for the delay. We had some technical difficulties here. Um, we are going to be moving into our delegation with Bear and Pear Productions. And uh, if you guys could please make sure you're using the microphone. Um, it's how our public that is viewing us online can hear us. And uh, please introduce yourselves. Thank you. Go ahead, see it. Was Just do a quick introduction. Um, so with respect to the presentation today from Bear and Bear, Bear and Pear Productions, portion, a portion of the presentation is going to be done in public session. And then there is a portion that is per FOIP section 27, privileged information. So we will have to move into closed session and they will let us know when we need to close the meeting off to the public. And just a further announcement to the public this morning, once we've completed with the closed session of the Bear and Pear Productions, we're going to be moving into closed meeting for the remainder of our meeting to discuss the organizational review. A portion of that will be brought to public session in the March Council meeting. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. All right, go ahead, gentlemen. Good morning, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Laszlo Urich, I'm a location manager. Aha, uh -huh. okay, that's much better. Uh, my name is Laszlo Urich, I'm a Calgary-based, Alberta-based location manager. I'm working on a project um, with uh, Bear and Pear Productions. Uh, also joining us uh, by Zoom is Alan Bartolik, who is the um, head location manager for this project. He's joining us from uh, Vancouver. And sitting with me is uh, Mr. Murray Ord, who's also a location manager. You have lots of location managers here in the room today with you. Uh, Murray also served as the um, Alberta Film Commissioner back uh, a little while, so he has a lot of experience and, um, and um, knowledge bringing to this uh, production. Um, very briefly, um, to introduce the project, it's, it's a television series production which has chosen a set or a location in Exshaw for one of the scenes um, in the uh, film. Uh, specifically, um, there is a scene that is on Mount Allen Drive, the location that was selected for this for which we would like to cover the street with snow <coughs> and create a snow-covered landscape, very much what you would probably see this morning. And uh, for our purposes, if there's a massive snowstorm two days before we film, we'd be so happy. <laughs> so any of you out there that can make that happen or help us with that would be tremendous. So that, that would mean that we would wish to close that street for the duration of the filming, which would be a one day. But we would also like to have access uh, to that street for, for the snowstorm. If, 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 if it doesn't happen, we'll have to truck some snow in and set it up. So that would probably take about two days. Uh, so th the notice and probably what most residents will be uh, noticing is the, uh, the traffic that will be affected for those two, three days along Mount Allen Drive. And we have already uh, contacted all of the residents uh, <coughs> along there and are working with them to, uh, to make, this, uh, make this project uh, come alive and happen. There are a number of other considerations which we can address later on as well. Uh, but that's essentially, uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's it. Once we complete filming, we clean up uh, it will probably take about a day or two to make that street look nice and clean again. And uh, whatever dressings we have brought in or, or addressed with the, um, the uh, residents along the street, that's all reclaimed and cleaned up in, in about a couple days afterwards. And that's essentially the extent of, of our uh, production in at uh, Mount Allen Drive. Um, thank you very much. And if you have any questions about that, we'd be happy to. Thank you. Is there any questions? I have a question for administration, and we haven't uh, done this too many times since I've been on council, but what is the process? I know there is an application process, um, and what is that process? 
Thank you, Reeve. I'm going to put Director of Planning and Development Services, <laughs> Haley Gavin, on the spot for this one. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, through the CAO to the Reeve and Council, thanks for the question. Um, so we do have a, a special permits bylaw. So I was looking for a special permits application form that does not exist. So we currently use development permit applications and I am not sending these guys a DP application for this project. Um, so what we're working on is getting a finalized scope of work for the project. So um, the applicants here are aware of that and then working with our uh, insurance company and then legal to review any of the contracts that um, would be signed between the two parties. And then we would issue essentially a special events permit with a number of conditions that's been circulated to all the departments to make sure that we didn't miss anything um, and to ensure that our liability is reduced as much as possible. So that's kind of where we've got to in this process. Um, the window to the filming time is getting closer uh, if it hasn't changed. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we're currently just working through that. But I, I think moving forwards, we should have um, an actual application for these types of events. Thank you. Thank you for that. And in terms of uh, the disruption of uh, flow and traffic on that road, um, how will vehicles and school buses navigate around that? And I'm not sure if this is a Haley question or a production company question. <laughs> Good question. We, we can address that. And yeah. if I may uh, just show you a quick map here for your reference. Um, what is advantageous about uh, this particular location is, is the um, fact that there's no through traffic normally uh, Mount Allen Drive. Uh, so there's only traffic that would be to the uh, Exshaw School and of course the fire hall. Uh, our proposed detour uh, to get around Mount Allen Drive is simply to go on the east side along Yamnaska Drive and, uh, and then just hook around the fire hall and then uh, to the north of, the, um, of Mount Allen Drive, clear open access to the school and to uh, one other residence there and um, also to the, um, to the MD's uh, shop that's uh, located, uh, maintenance shop. Uh, while this detour is in effect, we have uh, traffic controllers and people on radios to assist the traffic coming around. And that would be primarily uh, school buses. And for the duration of the Mount Allen Drive closure, probably most likely also a few residents. For the residents, we will have the back lane open uh, that will be plowed out from the snow that's blown in, and they will have access to their homes from, uh, from the rear. This is something that is also in discussions with every individual uh, resident along that street. All right, thank you for that. And then uh, I guess, our Another question to go with that, are the school buses and the fire trucks able to get down that Yamneska Drive? Is that Excellent question. Uh, we have worked with the fire chief on determining uh, access to the fire hall to ensure that there are no complications. And um, that we have a solution that would work. Uh, we have... Um, been in contact with the, uh, the school district. We, we have not yet been successful to have a face-to-face -face with uh, the superintendent, given the, uh, the teachers convention and whatnot. Um, and we will work directly with them to ensure that school buses will have the proper access. Thank you. Are there any other questions or is there anything else you guys would like to add? I think in this forum, I, I, that is primarily kind of what the, the, the bulk of the information would be. There are other details which we can discuss uh, later otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
And if I may, just yep. with our friend Alan on the screen, Alan, if you have anything that you would also like to mention that I might have missed, um, everybody, this is Alan, uh, Alan Bartolik, our location manager in Vancouver. Hello. Um, there are, um, there's another component to our film activity um, uh, that um, maybe uh, is not a part of this part of the conversation, but uh, Laszlo, I know you know what I'm referring to. Um, is that uh, to be discussed in a different setting? I think we will be moving into a closed session uh, in a moment here. If everything that you'd like to share publicly has been shared, then we can move to the closed session. Um, very good. Um, I do have uh, some um, public messaging that sure. we would like to share with uh, with Bighorn and uh, surrounding communities will get the same thing. So it's a simple notification um, of road closures due to filming um, and an email address that you can reach out to that we were uh, hoping to get out through um, various news outlets as well as the uh, municipality of Bighorn uh, district uh, social media channels. Um, that language is approved. We're just simply going to um, adjust for the specific nature of what we're doing here. It's just a small tweak. So that's something that'll be um, available two weeks, I think is what we said in advance of the filming date, um, which we are hoping remains the 23rd, 24th of March. That's our aim for filming. That's a Saturday and a Sunday. So two weeks prior to that, uh, you know, the first week of March, we'll be sending that out. We can send it out in uh, draft form ahead of time for you to take a look at. Wonderful, thank you very much for that. All right, um, it sounds like we're ready to move to the closed session. Can I get a motion from somebody on the committee? Go ahead, Councillor Smith I'll has make it. the motion, yep. I'll call the question all in favor. Thank you. 